My name is Brenna, and I work as a paleontologist, which is someone who finds and restores fossils for a living. I really enjoy my job because it allows me to work with limited human interaction, and because I genuinely enjoy finding new fossils. It's like working on an extremely hard puzzle in which you have to find the pieces. I always get a sense of accomplishment when I either put together an incredibly difficult creature, or on the rare occasion when I find a new species. We were called to southern Utah in a remote section of national parks where rock formations and caves are prevalent. This place alone is home to so many unique dinosaur finds which often surprise people. When we go to locations like Utah, I bring a small team with me which is about three people, including myself, and we stay on site. Thankfully, my team consists of another girl named Katie, who's around my age, and an older gentleman that we call Papa John who was in his early 60s. Papa John had been doing this gig longer than me and Katie had been alive. He was super cool to work with and was also a complete stoner, which makes our camping trips all the more enjoyable. When we would take the crib, we'd bring a camper with us and usually just stay in there together. Thankfully, Papa John isn't a creep, but rather a grandfather-like figure which makes sharing the same space for a few weeks bearable. Katie is like most girls where I'm not. I've been told that I give off a punk vibe, but I don't quite see it. It's probably because of my tattoos. Anyways, back to the story. We had been working on the side of this mountain one day, getting samples for a possible site to find more fossils, when Papa John goes for one of his walks, aka his smoke break. When I say smoke, I don't necessarily mean a cigarette. Instead of old John coming back with blazed eyes and a slight stagger in his step, he comes back, out of breath and with excitement. Katie and I shoot her heads up to see he's holding something. It appears to be a small rock that had been cracked down the middle, encasing the remains of a fossil. Apparently his smoke break actually yielded results to our dig site, and he happened to stumble across a cool find. It wasn't the rock that excited him though, more so where he found the rock. He told us to follow him, which we did confusingly. He took us down this beaten path that lined the base of the mountain. The right side of the path had been overgrown with brush and sage, which made going down the path a bit of a squeeze. John was always good about finding good places to smoke so he wouldn't get caught. This was definitely the place to do it. As we continued to press through the intense brush, we eventually arrived at John's prized location at the base of the mountain. There was a large boulder that appeared to be covering what looked like an entrance to a cave. John was convinced that this cave was sure to have priceless fossils hidden inside. The only problem was that we needed to find a way to move this boulder. John, being old in age and not having any equipment with them, was not able to move the boulder, but he figured that me and Katie with a few pickaxes would be able to chip away the boulder enough for one of us to slip inside. Looking at the truck-sized boulder, this would take us some time. I went back to the RV and grabbed two pickaxes and a shovel. Katie and John stayed back. We started working on the boulder, but we were only able to work for an hour or two before the sun got too low. We figured that it would be okay to leave our tools here since the area was completely hidden. We were the only ones in the area anyways. We went back to the RV and had our typical evening of having a small dinner and playing cards. John smiled the entire night, ear to ear with excitement. He kept telling us the best finds of his career have always been in areas of shelter, much like a cave. Southern Utah was a hotspot for things like this. The night continued on with high energy and anticipation for what was to come of the cave. There was a good chance that we'd be able to find valuable minerals in there as well, depending on the age of the cave. John woke us up early the next morning with coffee and singing. He was ready to get the day started despite it still being dark outside. Nonetheless, this didn't stop the jolly man from handing us headlamps and skipping down to the cave. Katie and I were not morning people, however it was hard to stay mad at John for long. We made it back to the entrance of the cave where nothing seemed out of place. Our tools still remained in the same place as well as the menacing boulder that prevented our entry. Katie and I worked at chipping at the sides of the boulder while John dug at its base. The chipping seemed nearly pointless since the progress was so minimal. I was certain that the right people with the right equipment would be able to move this in mere seconds, 
but time nor money happened to be on our side. About halfway through the day, John was able to dig enough at the base of the boulder to make it shift about a foot. This was just enough to open a small hole near the bottom where the boulder met the cave. Although being a small opening, it was just enough to send one person in without any gear. John was too big and I had claustrophobia, so I definitely wasn't going into the entrance until the hole was bigger. This left it to Katie, who was always up for a challenge. She took off her gear and got on her hands and knees and tried wiggling her way in. She kept her headlamp on from earlier this morning and peered inside. She told us how large the cave was and that we definitely all needed to come in and explore it. We handed her her gear and told her that we'll keep working on the boulder without her while she explored. We told her to be careful and not to get lost. Caves were notorious for people going missing. We worked more on the boulder which took us some more time. Another hour or two and we managed to produce another four inches on both sides of the hole. This still wasn't enough for John to fit in and I still wasn't comfortable trying to squeeze in with this size. We called into the hole for Katie to give us a quick update, but she didn't answer. We figured she was too far into the cave for her to hear us, and we just kept working. We worked a little bit more before John and I decided to take a quick smoke break. I really wasn't one for smoking, but I was tired and I still needed a break. We just sat off the side of the boulder and John and I lit a smoke. I drank a Powerade that had been in my bag while downing a cliff bar that had since melted from this morning. I was catching a bit of secondhand smoke from John's weed and I felt a little lightheaded. John and I were talking about music and other random things when we heard a muffled scream coming from inside the cave. We looked at each other, rather confused, and snapped out of our trance we had. John and I both ran over to the hole and peered inside while shining a flashlight. Katie, are you okay? John's genuinely concerned. However, we got no response, which was rather concerning. John looked to me with shock on his face. We need to open this cave right now, he said. A chill went down my spine when I said I'd go in just to check on her. John looked even more surprised. Bruna, are you sure? You don't have to do this. I know you have claustrophobia. We can work on the boulder some more so you don't feel so claustrophobic. I sized a slightly bigger hole up in my mind and I figured it was doable. Frankly, this was a lie. I took off my bag and put on my headlamp. The lamp wasn't very bright, but it was better than nothing. I started going in head first and I worked my way in. The cave immediately opened up once I got a few feet inside, which was reassuring. However, I felt pressure on all sides of my body while pushing through. This triggered my phobia and I began to slightly panic. I pushed through more hastily and finally made it in without having a full panic attack. I felt proud of myself. I was able to overcome one of my greatest fears that I had in a very much needed situation. I snapped out of my self-congratulations and began my search for Katie. The cave was tall and was somewhat wide, but completely dark save for the small hole of light I just entered from. The hole was able to illuminate about 20 feet or so, but anything beyond that was completely dark. I was able to notice that on the ground were footprints. Footprints who would have had to have been Katie's. This should make finding Katie rather easy for me, since the cave had yet to split in other directions, which caves were known to do. I made sure not to wander too far, yet I kept a watchful eye out for Katie. I called out her name rather loudly since I had no need to be quiet. I was trying to find someone, so this was the best course of action. My cell phone obviously was not able to work since we were in the cave and it had poor reception. I kept following the footprints which went deeper into the cave. The cave not only went into the mountain, but also on a downward slope. The cave's floor went from dirt to mud and now to stone which made tracking Katie's prints nearly impossible. I couldn't help but notice the temperature getting slightly more and more cold. This was fine although I wasn't dressed for anything below 70 degrees. I also noticed that my senses were on high alert. I attributed this to my adrenaline pumping from my claustrophobic encounter from earlier. My hair stood on the back of my neck and I now felt scared. I was deciding if the search would have to wait for John to open the cave more and he could come inside and that's when I heard it. That's when I heard a scream. Not Katie's scream to be exact, but rather something else. It didn't sound like Katie at all. 
It sounded like some type of large predatory animal. I froze in my place, but I then realized that the cave system often had air circulate throughout them, creating strange sounds. I only knew this because I'd worked on an excavation that was once in a cave. The sounds can be terrifying, much like the one I just heard, but when you realize that when air is flowing through jagged rocks, much like the ones that were lining this wall, it makes sense. Essentially, it made the cave a giant death whistle. I was tempted to call out again to Katie, but the gust of wind that resembled a scream had caused me to no longer be as brave. I turned back to check up on John to see what progress he had made, and also to alleviate some nerves that I had recently acquired. Thankfully, I hadn't made it too deep into the cave, so the walk back only took a few minutes. When walking back, I could see the light coming from the hole and movement from outside. Before I was within talking distance, I heard a rock fall deep from within the cave, roughly where I was just standing. Could this be Katie? I stopped in my tracks and looked both ways, back to the entrance and then again to the sound that came from within the darkness. I decided to check in with John to let him know that I was okay and that I thought I heard Katie. I went over to the hole and I noticed that it was much smaller now. My heart sank. There was no way I was going to be able to get through this hole. John, what happened to the hole? I screamed. Sorry, Brenna, he shouted. When I was digging the boulder, it readjusted due to the soft soil. However, I heard Katie on the other side of the boulder. Brenna, I found a way out of there, she exclaimed. You just need to go deeper in and take a left at the large stalactite. From there, you'll be able to hike up and out near the camper. But be careful. I think there's something living inside. My fear became paralyzing. I know that Katie was just trying to help, but that information absolutely terrified me. I just considered waiting by the entrance until they were able to shift the boulder again, but that could take hours. Plus, I could tell that it was getting dark outside since the light that was coming in was much more dim. My thoughts raced about the gust of wind and the rock that fell from earlier. Hopefully, that was the cause for the rock to fall and not some large animal that was going to eat me. I hiked a good ways into the cave, but I'd yet to see any mineral formations that even resembled a stalactite. Thankfully, my LED headlamp had fresh batteries from this morning, so I could count on those for a few good hours of light before my light gave out. I walked further in and heard a wind of gust much louder this time, however it didn't sound like the one from before. This time it had a whistle to it and actually felt the gust of wind. This was both good and bad since whatever I heard earlier might not have been a wind gust. However, this did mean that I was near a cave entrance. I pressed on further into the cave, doing my best to stay calm and to find the underground landmark to guide me to the exit. But the further I went, the more I felt despair and hopelessness. I'm not exactly sure if this had anything to do with the cave itself or the looming idea of there being something malicious hiding in its depths. I did my best to try to stay silent so I could try to hear more wind gusts, but also to try to stay concealed in the darkness that surrounded me. Up ahead, I heard something. This time, it wasn't a gust of wind or a scream from some kind of animal, but rather, shuffling. As if something was walking on all fours and they were crawling throughout the cave, not knowing what to do since I had no way to defend myself nor anywhere to really run, I did the only thing I could do in my state of panic, which was to turn off my light. This was a huge risk, since most of, if not all animals that inhabit caves have the ability to see in the dark. If this was the case, then turning off my light would only put me at a disadvantage. I had to act fast since whatever was coming at me seemed to be coming quickly. There was a good chance that whatever it was had already seen my light, but I had to try. I turned off my light and held my breath. The shuffling continued up until where I was standing, and it stopped. My heart sank and my blood froze. Something knows that I'm here. Instead of shuffling, I then heard the sound of sniffing coming from a small distance away. It was as if whatever it was knew I was there, but couldn't quite pinpoint exactly. I leaned up against the wall of the cave and ran my hands along the wall, hoping for something to try to climb up onto. I grabbed what felt like a solid hold that could elevate me up a few feet, and I silently started climbing. My feet felt around for any type of support to try to help lift me, 
but I felt nothing. I then pushed on the wall of the cave with both my feet and pulled myself up using non-existent upper body strength. The hold I was grasping with my shaky hands started to crack and completely disconnected from the wall. I then fell only a few feet, but it was enough to get the attention of whatever was sniffing. By whatever unfortunate circumstances that caused the rock to disconnect from the wall, fate now seemed to somehow be in my favor, as I was now holding a large rock in my hand. Before I could even register the pain from falling for those few feet, I was then grabbed by the creature. To my surprise, I was not met with sharp teeth, but rather, rough textured hands. Something grabbed my legs and let out a scream that resembled the sound I had heard earlier in the cave. My instincts kicked in and I swung the rock that I was holding in the direction of the scream, and instantly connected with soft tissue. But I also heard a cracking sound upon connection, then sobbing sounds. I was confused as I was under the impression I was being attacked by some kind of animal, but it was now crying. Did I just hit someone in the face with a large rock? My adrenaline was at an all-time high and I was very confused. I turned on my headlight not thinking about the situation, and I instantly regretted it. My light shined on what looked like a woman, but her hair was ragged and it covered her face. The woman was wearing pelts of fur from other animals which looked like they were rotting. The woman was clutching her face that was spewing dark red blood profusely. The woman was crouched down, which made her seem normal size, but when I tried to speak to her and apologize, she glanced over at me through her matted hair and stood up. The woman was grotesquely tall. I was more confused than anything by this. Her arms were long and connected to ungodly looking hands. Her hands had long brown fingernails that resembled claws. The woman was no longer sobbing and she removed her hand from her face, revealing that I had indeed smashed her in the mouth with a rock. Her sobbing turned into rage as she revealed her teeth that were now reddened and broken. My first hit with the rock was a miracle since I'm very uncoordinated. I tried to throw the rock at the woman but I was nowhere near hitting her. I turned and immediately ran. I could hear the woman behind me drop to all fours and begin pursuing me. The adrenaline was able to give me a quick boost of stamina but it didn't last long. I heard the screams coming from behind me but to my surprise. I also heard distant screams ahead of me. It was as if she was alerting others. As I ran, I then entered what appeared to be a large opening in the cave. To my horror, it revealed a horrific sight of more creatures like the woman. However, they seemed to be eating something and were rather distracted by my entrance. I could see that what they were eating due to the colors of the clothes of the person were bright and recognizable. They were eating Katie. Thankfully, the creatures were preoccupied with their current meal that they seemed to not care that I was in their place. I continued past the small group and pressed on into the cave looking for anything that could get me out of here. The woman, however, continued her pursuit despite being a good distance away. The woman, or should I say creature, was starting to make ground as I began to tire from fatigue. All seemed lost as I didn't really have anywhere to go. There was a good chance that this cave didn't even have another entrance. However, my light then caught a flash of a stalactite that hung right before the entrance of two caves. I remember Katie's instructions to take the cave to the left, which I did. The cave took a sharp left. Thankfully, the advice from Katie seemed to prove useful, as I saw that the cave veered up and to the left. The incline was steep and the ground was wet from moisture. A light current of water came in slowly trickling in on jagged rocks, making my footing very slippery. I was then forced to go on my hands and knees to scale my way up without slipping. The wet rocks also seemed to slow the creature behind me enough to ascend without being attacked. I finally reached the top of the cave and to my delight, it led to another small opening that led outside. Thankfully it wasn't small enough to trigger my claustrophobia, but I did have to duck to get through. I went outside and saw that the exit was on the side of the mountain that seemed extremely out of the way. It was now nighttime and it was raining. I was able to quickly look around and see her camper a good distance away, and the lights were on. I wasn't sure if the creature was still behind me, but I didn't take any chances. I shuffled down quickly the steep mountain and sometimes having to slide down on my bum, which tore up my pants, but I didn't care at this point. I could now feel the pain of all the scratches and bruises my horrific pursuit had incurred. My hands were cut and my legs ached from the small fall and from all the running. 
I reached the trailer and fell down while banging on the trailer door. I was met by Papa John and by Katie. I was out of breath and I couldn't say anything for a few seconds. I pointed at Katie in confusion and I tried to explain what I saw in the cave. They were eating her. Katie and John both looked at each other and grinned at me with a wide smile revealing long sharp teeth. Both then started to convulse and shake wildly shifting into those creatures from inside the cave. They both grabbed me and rather than kill me right then and there, they began to drag me back into the cave. My dad died last year in a car wreck, which was a terrible tragedy. I was in my late 20s and I'm an only child, so I inherited a large portion of his inheritance. My grief-stricken mother received his life insurance and warned me to be smart with the money. I was working as a car cleaner at a local dealership, which paid barely more than minimum wage. I had gone to college but dropped out due to partying too much and sloughing on my grades. I was never one for school. I always thought it was for suckers that didn't know how the real world works. You didn't need to know how to use the Pythagorean theorem to start a company or to buy a house. Anyways, I've always had plans to start my own company. I follow a bunch of people on social media that have these rental properties and timeshares and make tons of money off of them. I figured that that's how I could actually make money and invest. Now was the time to do that. At first, I considered investing into crypto or random stocks like Tesla, but I figured that rental properties were the way to go. That even if no one were to rent them, I could at least live in them for a time being. I searched the local real estate listings for great properties that I could rent, but I was looking for quantity, not quality. Everything I was looking at at the time would run me dry, and I wouldn't even get two properties out of it. I needed something more off the grid. Something I could buy cheap and build multiple units. I was driving late one night and I noticed on the outskirts of town that there was a large property with old rundown homes on it. There were about three homes with a trailer and other stuff on the property. I pulled off to the side of the road and got out to see if there was any listing for the property since it looked like no one lived there. It was around one in the morning or so and there weren't any lights coming from inside any of the homes so I figured that jumping the fence and taking a quick look would be fine. The fence was an old rusted barbed wire fence that had tons of slack on it, so I was able to easily step over it. I walked quickly with my smartphone out and turned on my flashlight feature. The more I walked onto the property, the more I saw trash and other garbage lying around. I noticed that there were two old looking cars that were around the late 1970s with rusted frames and non-existent glass in any of the windows. They were parked next to this old trailer that was missing a door. I skipped over the trailer since I was not interested in it and would end up throwing it out anyways if I was given the chance. I took a quick look at the outside of the house or what was left of the house and knew right away that I wouldn't be able to use them since they were structurally unsound. However, despite not wanting to keep the house, curiosity did get the better of me and rather than just accepting the house as being unsafe, I decided to take a look inside. The interior was equally unimpressive as it revealed a ruined result of a decaying home. At first glance, the walls were lined with graffiti and the floors were covered with trash. However, there was something off about the graffiti on the walls that began to give me a sense of dread. Normally, graffiti is random ramblings of curse words, slurs, and your occasional outlines of obscene images. However, this graffiti looked different. The markings on the wall looked more coordinated in terms of color and in style of images. After closely shining my smartphone's light upon the dirty brown walls, I then realized that the markings were symbols, all with different colors and shades of red. Some markings looked newer than others. I didn't want to say that the symbols were letters, but they were unlike anything I'd ever seen. Amongst the symbols were also very grotesque depictions of stick figures being subjected to what I can only describe as some type of evil force that would either torture or consume the stick figures in some way. These depictions also followed the same style that the symbols were drawn, as if the symbols in the drawings were all from the same source. After seeing no more than a few minutes of what I can only imagine to be mad rantings of an extremely disturbed person. I decided that what I was seeing was enough for me to leave. However, I was also compelled by a completely morbid side of me to take photos of these images, mainly to try to see if I could find the meaning of any of this on the internet. 
As I was taking photos and slowly making my way out of the home, I noticed that the symbols led me to a doorway that had a set of stairs going downwards. On the doorway, however, was written a word that I did understand. A word that both disturbed me but also grabbed my attention in a way that I couldn't turn down, despite how terrifying it may have been. The word was... Hell. My body was telling me that there were unspeakable horrors awaiting me in the darkness that laid beneath, but my mind was all too curious. I shined my phone's light down the half dozen wooden steps and saw that the writings continued. My step on the stair let out a creak that shook every bone in my body. It was as if I was awakening the devil himself. I held my breath as I continued down, knowing fully well that I already made enough noise to alert anyone of my presence here. My descent down was exponentially worse. There was no moonlight coming in from broken windows to supplement additional light like it did upstairs. This basement carried a fog of darkness and an ever so slight tinge of hopelessness. The basement reeked of death and decay that smothered you like a dirty blanket that you couldn't remove. I could feel myself losing my mental fortitude, as if I would be enslaved to this basement forever. I reached the bottom of the stairs and, either out of habit or for a cry for help, I tried the light switch that laid at the bottom of the stairs. To my shock and pleasant surprise, the basement imperfectly illuminated a dirty yellow glow casting undeserved light on the wretched filth that inhabited the basement. The only light bulb that lit up the basement was next to another doorway in the corner of the basement. I could see old furniture covered with black mold and mounds of what looked like wet carpet in the middle of the floor. I noticed despite the mess that the floor in the middle had more writings, except these looked much more different than the ones upstairs. These looked like symbols from upstairs, but they were neat and organized in what appeared to be a perfect circle. I was preoccupied with the symbols on the floor and the light being inadequate for basic vision that I didn't realize that the wet mound of carpet that laid in the center of the circle was actually decayed flesh of an assortment of animals. That is, until my flashlight better illuminated the horrors before me. At that very moment, my eye caught movement ever so slightly coming from the doorway next to the light. I didn't see a demon or a serial killer with a hockey mask. What I did see was a long protruding arm reaching towards the single bare light bulb, grasping it with impossibly long fingers and crushing the bulb and the only other light source besides my pitiful phone. The bulb made a loud popping sound, causing me to jump and drop my phone into the mound of flash. Thankfully, my phone landed downwards where the light on the back was still able to cast light upwards. I didn't bother going for my phone at all, but rather, I ran through the basement, up the stairs and out of the house. The next thing I knew, I was outside and out of breath. I'm not entirely sure if I was followed or not, but... Nonetheless, the experience was one I never forget. I jogged back to my car, looking back at the home that hid those horrors beyond my imagination, half expecting to see some ungodly creature crawl out after me, but nothing. I stood half terrorized, yet also confused. Is it possible that I imagined that? Not the writings or the mounds of flesh, but the arm. The basement was dark and I couldn't see that well. Well, regardless. There was no amount of money that could have been offered for me to go back into that basement to retrieve my cell phone. Needless to say, I was no longer interested in this property. I moved to Texas in February of 2020, but had to fly to Utah with a friend to pick up my car from my brothers. We get there early and decide to do a last minute photo shoot for said friend. It caused us to leave Utah late, approximately 6 p.m. We grabbed all of our snacks and started our 20 hour drive back to Texas. As we were nearing the border of New Mexico, we were still in Arizona. Sleepiness began to hit me and we decided we'd spend the night in Albuquerque. It was only a few hours away we drove around 4 a.m. to get a few hours of sleep and head back out. I remember feeling weird the closer we got to New Mexico. As we entered it, my heart rate spiked and I was wide awake. It was sort of what I would consider the looming feeling of doom. I shrugged it off as nighttime anxiety originally. I shouldn't have. We got onto US 491 and as such, 
You have to pass through a reservation to get to the main highway for Albuquerque. The speed limit dropped from a normal 80 miles per hour to maybe 35, 45 miles per hour. I thought that this was odd, but the road had a lot of weird turns and dirt being kicked up, so I figured it was more of a safety precaution. It's maybe 2, 3 a.m. at this point, and my friend had her head against the window while I was playing music loudly. I thought they were asleep, but I recently asked them, and they said that they were wide awake too. Something about entering New Mexico also freaked them out. As I got further into the reservation, I heard a sharp knock on the roof of my car. It was a quick tap-tap, but hard enough to be clearly heard over the music. My friend was startled and asked what had happened. I shrugged. I started to think the worst, but I did not want to stop. I'd rather have rock damage or have killed something than stop on that road. It was dark, and I just knew deep down I shouldn't stop on this road. Instincts, intuition maybe, I don't know. Now I have a brand new car with insanely bright LED headlights, coupled with my brights. I could see a few miles ahead of where my car was going. My friend was watching the road when we noticed a shadow on the side of the road. I slowed down while I was still a good distance away to get a better look. What I saw freaks me out to this day. The best way I can describe it was a body of a human, half contorted downward, almost as if its spine had been snapped in half. Its head was upside down with its hair falling limply away from its face. Thinking back, the hair reminded me of smoke tendrils. It looked like it was flowing in the wind. Its arms were large stalactite looking things supporting its contorted body. Whatever it was, it was so dark that my headlights couldn't penetrate it. However, it illuminated everything around it. Its face, if you could call it that, wasn't looking at us originally but it twisted its head around to look at us. Its hair flowed with it. It didn't have facial features, but it looked distorted like it had a broken jaw or something. Its jaw just looked deformed, almost misplaced from the rest of its body. I couldn't make out any of its features because it was almost blurry. I pride myself on my photographic memory, but it was like it didn't want me to see it like I wasn't supposed to be seeing it. At this point, we're no more than 50, 75 feet away, and I step on it, quickly exhilarating from 20 to 30 miles per hour I was going to 120. My friend asks if I saw that, and I nodded my head. I didn't even want to talk if I was being honest. I didn't want to breathe. I was shaking so badly. It felt ominous, evil. I can't even explain in full detail the fear I felt. It was like it penetrated my bones. It was a primal instinct to run and run as fast as I could to get away from it. Everything in me told me to look forward, to pretend I didn't see what I saw. I remember my friend reaching over and gripping my hand tightly. Don't look back. We don't want it to follow us. I drove that fast until we were off the reservation. I would take a speeding or reckless driving ticket then stop on that road. We ended up not stopping in Albuquerque. I drove all the way to Lobick instead and we spent the night there. We only slept two hours before we kept driving. We were both unnerved and petrified. The fear still seeps into my bones sometimes. What I saw I shouldn't have been allowed to see. I told my grandma, and she immediately did my culture's sacred rituals to try to cleanse any attachments that may have been formed. My friend and I still talk about it occasionally. We tell the story to those who will believe us, although most don't. I mean, who would? We sound sleep-deprived and crazy, but if you were there you would have felt it too. It felt demonic, foreboding, evil. 
P.S. We found out recently U.S. 491 was formerly U.S. 666. Consulting isn't exactly what I'd call my dream job. I originally went into my line of work because I loved being in the outdoors and surrounded by nature. While I technically did get that out of this job, it wasn't exactly in the form that I had imagined or wanted. I had dreams growing up having an impact on the world and the environment. Clean up oil spills, stopping climate change, save the penguins, you know, stuff like that. Unfortunately, no one told me when I went into this field that unless I wanted to devote years of my life in school, I wouldn't be making that much money. Everything that interested me was either vastly underpaid or volunteer work. Everything that is, except for consulting. Yeah, consulting. You know, those annoying guys who show up at your property every time you want to add an extension to your house to charge you money for damaging the environment. Yep, that's me. Like I said, this isn't exactly what I had in mind when I went into the environmental field. For the most part, my experience in this job has been boring to the point where I'd put myself to sleep elaborating to them. Someone comes to our company describing the work that they want done to their property, and we show up and assess it for the environmental compensation that would have to be done. Usually, the most interesting occurrences during these excursions are when a client doesn't like what we find and proceeds to condescendingly berate us for doing our jobs. I warned you. It's boring. One job I had a couple months ago, though, changed the way I see the world. I still blame myself for what had happened. Maybe if I had done more, maybe lied about a wetland existing on the property or something like that then, well, maybe things would have been more different. It started off like any other week. I walked into the office in combating traffic for the best part of the hour and opened my laptop to look over my emails that I had gotten over the weekend, or any new assignments that my workaholic boss Jason had sent me in the early hours of the morning. I remember that morning I had less emails than I normally would, which would indicate that I might have a relatively light week. But there was one email from Jason. Hey Rita, this request came in late on Friday. The location is blank. Would you and David mind stopping by there to do your usual checks? For the safety of anyone who's hearing this, I've left out the name of the town and area the site is in. I rolled my eyes, deciding I would wait until later in the morning so that I could have my cup of coffee and get some paperwork out of the way before having the deal with being on the road again. After a couple of hours of doing mental office work, I grabbed David. David was a good guy, fresh out of college, the first in his family to do so. His parents didn't have it easy, and this job had become the main source of income for his family. When I can, I send his family what I can afford. It's not much, but I've tried to do everything I can to help his family since they lost David. David and I had a nonchalant drive over to the site, which I blame on our office's lack of caffeinated coffee and overabundance of decaf. We arrived at the location to find out that it was completely underdeveloped. There wasn't even a driveway for us to park our company car. We ended up parking on the edge of the forest and realized that the site that the client wanted to build on was beyond the region of trees, after which there would be a clearing a decent distance within the woods. They're gonna have to pay a fortune just to get a driveway. David remarked as we started entering the forest. I replied rather absent-mindedly, keeping my focus on not falling over. In this line of work, you gain a lot of experience trekking around in the wilderness. But there was something about this land that was giving both of us a hard time. There wasn't a lot of debris on the ground, or anything to trip us over. It seemed as if the soil itself was loose. Once we made it halfway through, David called out to get my attention. 
Rita, come over here. Check this out. I walked over to where David was standing and saw that he had discovered what appeared to be a deer skull, apparently bare of any flesh and still with its antlers attached. I understand that for a normal person hearing this might be unsettling, but honestly at the moment, we didn't think anything of it. We worked in nature a lot, and it wasn't completely unusual for us to come across animal carcasses. After all, animals have to die somewhere. In retrospect though, we should have wondered why it was the only skull that we found, and what happened to the rest of the skeleton. Nice, I said, snapping a picture to show my friends later, so I could at least pretend that my job was cool. David cracked some joke that I can't remember anymore, and we continued on to the clearing. With the unusual soil throwing off our footing, it took us a half an hour to arrive to the clearing where the client wanted to build. At first glance, there wasn't anything unusual about the clearing. It was just that, a place devoid of trees in the middle of the wooded area that was rather close to a road not too far off the highway. We began our work, which consisted of taking soil samples as well as identifying plants, insects, and if seen, animal species that inhabited the perimeters in which the client wished to build. Since the clearing was rather large compared to most sites that we visit, David and I decided to split up the work with each of us taking half of the allotted property to inspect. I ended up getting stuck with the half of the clearing that was on the other side of where we had entered, so I had the trot all the way over to the other forested edge of the property so that I could begin to approximately survey the expanse. When I was just some ten yards away from the edge of the clearing, I tripped over something I couldn't see, forcing a rather embarrassing yelp from myself as I tumbled downwards to the ground. You good there? David called out from the other side, noticing my clumsiness. Yeah, I yelled back. Just tripped over something. From a distance, I could see David return the survey in his half of the area. I got up and brushed the dirt off myself and glanced around to see if I could find what had thrown me off my footing. After a few moments, I had found it. It took me a little bit to figure out what it was. The moment I figured it out, though, my heart sank a bit. It was a tombstone, or at the very least, a part of it. What I had tripped over was just a piece of a tombstone. I could tell just from the stone material that it was part of something that had once been a grave marker. All I could see was the last two letters of a name, as well as the last number of the year the individual was born in, and the year in which they died, which was 1847. It's funny as it may seem, my thought was, how much does a developer have to pay if they have to exhume bodies from the site? The more I thought about it though, the more I just wanted to sweep the whole matter under the rug. After all, there was clearly no sign of a road of any type in this area when we had gotten here. Why would there be a graveyard here? And who's to say that this tombstone portion wasn't planted here by somebody else? I uncomfortably moved to the end of the clearing and then did my job. I surveyed my half, paying note to the endangered plant or animal species that might be inhabiting the land that would affect any future construction plans, and that was that. Nothing eventful happened for the rest of the day. After David and I were both finished, we went back to the office, filed the necessary paperwork and reports, and just went home. Later that night, I was watching Netflix on my couch. Something caught my eye outside the apartment. I have an apartment on the ground floor with the tree line of a nearby wooded area about 20 feet away from my patio. I stood in front of the sliding door that separated the inside of my apartment from the patio, trying to see if I could see what had caught my attention. I could hear some leaves rustling and a branch breaking behind the tree line but otherwise it was too dark to be able to make out anything. Assuming it was just a fox or some other animal, I went back to watching my shows, then slept and forgot about the whole thing. 
I went to work the next day to find that I had been given another assignment, much lighter than the one I had been given the other day. I went to David's desk to ask him if he wanted to tag along for the outdoors mission that morning, but when I saw him at his desk, I was shocked at how he looked. His eyes were glazed over and he had dark circles around them and he looked absolutely pale. Hey David, are you okay? You don't look so good. Huh? He asked, shifting his pale, glazing face over in my direction, obviously taking a moment to process what I had just said. Uh, yeah. Didn't get much sleep last night. You go ahead, I've got some paperwork to catch up on. Normally, such an answer would have annoyed me, but seeing how today's sight was much smaller and how David obviously wasn't doing well, I quickly agreed and went on my way. This trend continued for the next couple of days, with David looking worse and worse each subsequent day. Then came the day where he didn't show up at all. Have you heard from David? Jason asked me around lunchtime. No, not today, have you? No, he didn't even call or text me that he's not coming in today. My boss said with a worried look. He shrugged and muttered to himself as he walked back into his office. An hour later, he came back out to the office space we were all seated at, looking visibly shaken. Uh, I think it's for the best that everyone takes the rest of today and tomorrow off. I'll be in touch later. It wasn't typical of Jason to be so flustered, and even more rare for him to give us any unexpected time off. It was unsettling, but all of us who were there left for the day. It was only when I got home and turned on the news that I had learned what had happened. David's mother was hysterical on the news. She kept repeating that over the last few days, David had kept saying he had seen someone or something on the edge of his family's property line, but no one could see it either. However, it obviously affected David to the point where he couldn't sleep or function. That morning, when he wasn't up to get into work in time, his mother came into his room and found his head on his bed, still on his pillow. Just his head. The police were investigating heavily due to the brutality of the murder, as well to the fact that no sign of forced entry had been found. I was shaken to my core. I couldn't sleep that night. Because I was still awake at 3 in the morning, I could hear the rustling outside my apartment again. As opposed to a few days ago though, this sounded closer. Much more scared than I was the last time, I peeked out the blinds of my window and saw nothing, much to my comfort. The next night was when I saw it for the first time though. That dang deer skull that we saw near that clearing in the woods. It was on a body that was cloaked in some black cloth or fur, to the point where it looked almost as if it was floating. I hid under my covers until dawn. I grabbed everything valuable of mine that I could, withdrew all of my money from my bank, and drove and drove and drove non-stop until I hit the nearest nunnery, deciding that my 20-year streak of being a rebellious, relapsed Catholic had run its course. It sounds silly, I know, but I've been holed up in here the last two years. I still see it at the edge of the forest line that dang cursed skull on a black silhouette of a body. I think I made the right choice though, as it seems that it cannot cross into the nunnery itself. I keep wondering if I could really live out the rest of my days on this small property, to never venture outside and see the world again. But then I remember what happened to David, and his poor family having to see what was left of him. I won't do that to my family, and above all else, I won't give it the satisfaction. Whatever that thing is, let it wait.
I've avoided telling this story before because I wanted to believe that it wasn't real, that it was just a dream, but I've read so many similar encounters that I feel like maybe I should tell someone. Maybe it was real, and something like this really lives out there. I wish I had known it was possible back then. The story starts at my aunt's house. At the time, my mother and father were going through a divorce. I was about 11, and my younger sister was only 6. The details of the divorce don't really matter, but we were staying at my aunt's house with my mom until she could find a place that she could afford on her own. My sister and I were too young to fully understand, so it was almost like a vacation. It helped that my aunt had a really cool house. It was big, and seemed even bigger to a couple of friends. I don't really know house lingo, but it was very modern, with two long main wings. One side housed the bedrooms and a small library, and the other had a kitchen. The kitchen had these huge windows, the kind where more modern style houses would have that would take up the whole wall. Nestled in this wall of windows was a sliding glass door, but my sister and I rarely used it because it was large and heavy and hard for us to open. Another thing about these windows, though, was that they faced the woods. My aunt's house was surrounded right on the edge of a large wooded area. The trees ended only a couple of feet away from where the sliding glass door was. Of course, this was one of the benefits of her house. Living near the woods was peaceful, or at least that's what my aunt always said. My aunt had a small sitting area by the windows where she could watch nature. She told us that oftentimes she had little herds of deer walk through, and that she'd even seen a mountain lion once. Anyways, you get the idea. It was a big house with big windows and it sat close to the woods. For the majority of the time that we lived there, there was no issue. My sister and I would even go play in the woods, always staying in sight of the house. My mother would often sit in the sitting area by the windows and keep an eye on us. We'd play hide and seek or tag or see if we could climb the trees. Things changed at night though. I hated those windows at night. When I'd walk down the long hallway to the south wing of the house to get a glass of water from the kitchen or something, I'd always see the trees moving, swaying unnaturally. Not like from wind, where it started from the top and worked its way down, but like something was pushing against them from below and the tree shook from that. It freaked me out, but I was 11 so it wasn't that hard. I'd usually just hurry up and get my water and run back to my room. I hated it so much that I rarely forgot to get water before bed after a couple of times. Wasn't risking that creepy crap again. Later on, I wasn't given a choice though. One night, I had a dream that my mother was calling me. Her voice was coming from the kitchen, asking for my help with something. Sarah. I stood up from bed and made my way towards where she called, my brain fuzzy from sleep. Her voice was soft, but it carried to me as I walked, warm and familiar. The closer I got though, the weirder it sounded, becoming slightly distorted and deeper. It was like a mix of my mother's voice with some animalistic cries that just got louder until I was shocked awake just before I stepped through the doorway into the kitchen. I quickly looked around, confused. My mom wasn't there, and the whole house was dark, except for the moonlight that illuminated just enough of the room for me to know that it was empty. I shrugged it off as a sleepwalking dream, though I had never had one before, so I just turned around and walked back to my room. A few nights passed before it happened again. This time, it was my father who called me. Please, he called. I need to talk to you. Come here. 
just like the last time, I stood up from my bed like in a trance, aware and unaware of what I was doing. Each step brought me closer to the kitchen where I could hear my father, his voice becoming more gravely and broken as I walked. I stepped into the kitchen and thought I saw him there, standing by the kitchen island, illuminated by the moonlight. He then turned and looked at me and I woke up, realizing there was nothing there after all. It took a few days again, but on the third night I heard my little sister, telling me that she hurt herself and that she needed my help. I stood up and started hurrying to the kitchen, ever the big sister. This time, I barely noticed when her voice started changing, becoming a distorted gasp as I drew closer. I stepped into the kitchen and I saw her. She was knelt crying on the ground near the windows. I started to walk over to her but stopped when I realized something. She was kneeling behind the glass. She was outside. Her cries became a laugh and I startled awake. <laughs> but I still saw a shape kneel just outside the window, only it was bigger and dark and misshaped. I screamed in terror and it moved faster than anything I had seen before, disappearing into the woods. My mother came running from her room, turning on the lights and comforting me. I told her about the sleepwalking and passing, and she chalked it up to me, still having been asleep when I told her about the monster. She walked me back to my room and had me take some sleeping medicine to help me get back to sleep. After that, everything seemed like it might be okay. A week passed, and then two. My mom found a nice apartment that she planned to move us into. My sister and I were sad to leave, but I was secretly relieved. I had been on edge ever since it happened, wondering if it would call to me again but everything was silent until the night before we were meant to leave. I was just starting to drift off to sleep when I heard shuffling outside my door. I froze, certain that the monster had returned for me, that it had somehow gotten into the house and was about to open my door, but the sound simply moved past me and went down the hall towards the kitchen. I stayed where I was, waiting to make sure it wasn't a trick, then got up as quickly as I could and crept over to the door. I hovered, unsure if I should open it. After a few seconds, I made up my mind to run to my mom's room and wake her up. I slowly cracked open the door and peeked into the hallway towards where the sounds were coming from. There, at the end of the hallway and shuffling into the kitchen was the form of my little sister. I blinked and then squeezed my eyes shut and opened them again, making sure I wasn't asleep. But no, she was real and she was disappearing into the kitchen right before my eyes. As I realized this, I realized I could hear something, a kind of faraway moaning whining coming from the direction she was going. Dread ran up my body and I looked down the hallway at my mom's door, the opposite direction that my sister was walking. Fear told me to run and get her first, but instinct moved my feet towards the kitchen where my sister had gone out of sight. I ran as silently as I could down the hall and peered around the doorway to look for her. There she was. She was standing right in front of the windows, her eyes open but glazed. As I watched, I realized the trees were swaying, the same way they used to but much faster now, and the swaying seemed to be getting closer, moving towards us at an alarming speed. I could hear the branches and the trees creak in protest as something hit them and the moaning whine I had heard from far away was getting closer, sounding like a dying animal. One tree was rocked so violently, a flock of birds flew screaming out off into the night air. As this was happening, my sister was reaching for something, the lock on the sliding door. Even at 11, 
I knew something was coming through the woods towards us, and it was running, sprinting right at my sister. I ignored the noise in my brain, telling me to run in the opposite direction towards my mother. The noise was all well-encompassing now. It had become a screeching so loud it sounded like it was all around me. I grabbed my sister around the waist, pulling her back just before her fingers touched the lock, and I pulled both of us behind the wall beside the window, just out of sight. The sound stopped. The trees no longer swayed and the screeching had fallen silent. I could hear my sister breathing frantically but I held her mouth closed, willing her not to cry. My own breathing was shallow and fast but as I tried to quiet it, I realized there was another sound. My sister's breathing, my breathing, and the even breathing of someone, something else, standing just outside the window next to us. A too large humanoid shadow blocked the moonlight that usually fell into the kitchen, and I watched the figure reach out its unnaturally long arm. I held my breath as I heard a scratching against the sliding door. and saw the shadow of the creature's arm touch where the handle of the door was. After a second, the creature withdrew its arm and let it fall to its side. Then it stood there, still for what felt like hours. Finally, the shadow shrunk and I could hear whatever it was leave. The underbrush rustled and the trees swayed, but the sound moved away this time instead of towards us. Still, I didn't move. I waited until all traces of its presence was gone before I slowly pulled my sister away towards the hall, keeping out of sight of the windows as much as I could. My sister was crying as I led her down the hall and I think I was squeezing her hand too tight but I felt overwhelming relief as I opened the door to my mother's room and crawled into her bed. My mother never believed us, of course, and we moved away the next day. I refused to return to my aunt's house ever since, and she eventually moved away. I never had an encounter like that again, but that might be because I stay away from the woods like a plague now. If you're a fan of hiking or camping or living near nature, all I could say to you is, good luck. You freaks out there like cryptids? Yeah, of course you do. You're listening to something like this after all. Well, I have a few stories about weird creatures, but here is one that might catch your interest the most. Around five years ago, there was this string of consistent reports of a strange person. Or, well, people would be more accurate. Sort of, anyway. They all followed the same behavior, and that is what tipped off a few people who were in the same circles of weirdness like myself. That The description of the person was always different. Male or female, fairly androgynous in appearance, always spotted in the late evening or early morning hours just whenever the sun was at its dimmest point. However, the person would always be underdressed for the current weather and always in fairly remote areas of the national park where this took place. The witnesses said the people were sketchy and skittish and would not respond when spoken to, just staring straight ahead and looking like a deer in headlights with big glassy eyes. Then, after just standing there, they would walk in a way to not break eye contact. They'd shuffle sideways or backwards and disappear into the woods. Well, the park rangers had never found so much in the way of evidence, so one guy during his downtime took it upon himself to get in the proof that some weirdos were actually out there in the woods. So this fine young man with too much time on his hands goes out there with a camera and a pack 
for three days, built just for roughing it in their great outdoors. Made sure his clothing was layered up so he can get some sleep one hour after the sun went down, and not eat a fire, and then wake up one hour before sun rises. Now, I am sure both you and him were expecting him not to find much for the first two days, but as his testimony is told, he was just waking up after 5 a.m. on the second day out there in the woods when some weird chittering noise was coming from behind a tree. So, he gets up and he lets his eyes adjust and to his surprise, something is out there. Not a person, but something crawling on four legs. Two legs in the back were bent like a grasshopper's and the two in the front looked like skinny human arms pulled itself forward. The thing's head was hanging down, but it looked like a noseless, beady-eyed, lipless attempt at a human face. It was pink and hairless all over. He recounted just standing there, watching in shock as he tried to process what the hell he was watching. He describes as the thing was walking just behind the trees beyond his campsite and faced in the direction of the sun. As it was cresting the horizon, he said that this creature stood on the back two legs, standing upright, that the joints in the legs then morphed and pushed forward until they looked more like human legs. The creature threw its head back, and what was the back of its head formed into a face, one more human than the other. The chest grew two lumps that formed into what resembled female breasts without any nipples. The rest of the creature remained motionless, featureless and smooth. No genitals, no hair, not a single blemish on its mockery of human anatomy. Then it changed its skin color from a light, fleshy pink to one of an African-American tone of skin. It stood there drinking in the first rays of sunlight and formed hair that covered its head. And then a shirt and shorts grew around its torso and waist. Despite being around 30 or so degrees, it just chose a casual pair of clothing to mimic somehow. It was by now our entranced explorer realized he had found his fabled freak show and was fishing for his camera. So the big brain takes it out, frames the shot, and snaps it. Flash and all. He said that the thing snapped its new face towards him, and despite looking shot, it never moved past that. So he did what any rational person at that point would do when a creature of the forest comes and looks at him. He threw a cliff bar at it and bolted away. Ran all the way back to the nearest ranger station and tells them about it. Of course he got laughed at, asked what he was smoking that night, and dismissed. Now I talked to that guy. And he seems pretty straight laced. Nothing that stood out as nutty to me. That's why with his testimony and the public reports and other speculations about that place, I am very inclined to believe this one. <laughs>